Uh, let me greet you uh, today in the name of Christ. We have decided to start a salvation as it is presented in the Bible, not salvation as it is presented by the different denominations, but salvation as it is taught in the Bible. We need to realize that salvation is the basis uh, of our faith, is the foundation of our faith. We could be wrong in many other doctrines with no uh, frightening consequences. <clears throat> but if we are wrong in our understanding, of salvation that has many ramifications. It's important that we understand salvation correctly. One cannot go to heaven with a faulty understanding of salvation because the person will not be correctly saved. It is that important. One cannot have a correct relationship with God without correct understanding of salvation. Our relationship with God is regulated by, uh, by salvation as it is explained in the Bible. Even more importantly, one cannot be properly discipled in fact, it is impossible to disciple someone who is not saved. And the one who tries to disciple someone, if he or she is not saved, uh, he or she will not be able to disciple someone. <clears throat> so salvation is important. Now, these teachings are based on a book which I've written, and the title of the book is The Mystery of Salvation. <clears throat> the Mystery of Salvation. Now, in this introductory teaching, we want to see four things. We have four main topics. One, the meaning of the word mystery. Two, mysteries of the gospel mysteries of the gospel, three, mystery as it relates to salvation, and the last point will be a mystery of salvation known experientially, those four points. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to be slowly, so that if you are taking notes, you might be able to take your notes, because this is a very important important topic. The first point then we want to discuss is the meaning of the word mystery. We want to discuss that. Uh, there are two ways of understanding the word mystery. Uh, the first way of understanding the word mystery is not biblical. Uh, it is espoused or taught by uh, people who believe in uh, false religions. Let me explain what that false understanding is. The first understanding of mystery uh, refers to hidden knowledge, hidden knowledge, which cannot be known, uh, which is known by a few people, a few people. And those that know it are not allowed to divulge it to others. In some religions, 
the mystery of that religion is not divulged to people outside of that religion. Only people in the religion are allowed to know that mystery. And you can only be exposed to the mystery after you have joined the religious groups, not before. Even within the religious groups, there are people at the very top who know things that other people don't know. So in this understanding of mystery, is that mystery is something that is secret. Uh, it's something that is not supposed to be divulged. It is known only by the members of the group. Even the members of the group, there are certain things they don't know, which are known by those at the very top. That's that first understanding of mystery. So religions like masonry, masons, and many other religions have secret knowledge which is not known by everybody. It is typical of religions, particularly mysterious religions. Uh, they don't allow people to know certain things. We use the word, it's known by the initiated, the initiates. People who have been initiated into the religion, then after initiation, or after introduction into a religion, then the mysteries of that religion are revealed to you. Usually, after you have known the mysteries of that religion, you are not allowed to leave the religion. If you leave the religion, something terrible will happen to you. I hope you have, I hope you have understood uh, that notion of religion, that notion of the word mystery. We use the word mystical, and the people who know the secrets are mystics. It's secret. Nobody outside of the religion is supposed to know. And even you, when you want to join the religion, you are not exposed to those secrets. You are only exposed after you've joined. And usually once you've joined, it is difficult to live. There's that understanding of mystery. Things known only by the members of the religion even within the religion, uh, there are things that members don't know which are known either by the, by the founder of the religion and the people who are close to the founder and others are not allowed to know. That notion of uh, mystery is unbiblical because in the Bible, we are told that the things of God, though deep and not known to people, uh, they are freely available. Now, I am sad to tell you that in the early history of the church, of the Christian church. The, the church held this view of mystery, something that is known only by a few people. For an example, uh, the Bible was written in Latin, and Latin was not the common language of the ordinary people. It was written, it was translated from Hebrew and Greek into Latin so that ordinary people should not have access to the truth of the Bible. And then there are people, if I remember correctly, like John Huss and others who translated the Bible from Latin 
into the common language, in this case, English. And those people were persecuted and they were burned at stake, which means they were burned publicly for having published the Bible from Latin to English, making the mysteries of God known to the lay people when the mysteries of God must be known only to the clergy. Only the clergy must know the mysteries of God and the lay people are not supposed to. We thank God that, that we thank God that uh, understanding of mystery uh, has been uh, rejected. And the Bible is, is not only translated into English, it is translated into my language, into my language, which is Kosa, into Zulu, into Susutu, and many other languages, so that everybody could have access to the word of God. Now that's the false understanding of mystery. Now the correct understanding of mystery is that it is something that is not known, which must be revealed in order for it to be known. Something not known, which is revealed in order for it to be known. For an example, my age is a mystery to some of you. You don't know it until I tell you. And you hope that in this recording I'll tell you, it will remain a mystery if you don't know it. Some of you don't know my mother and my father, it's a mystery. Some of you don't know my grandfather and my grandmother, it's a mystery because you don't know it. Uh, you will only know it if I tell you, if I reveal it to you. Some of you know my wife and others don't know my wife. You don't know her name, you don't know her age, those things are, are mysterious to you. But when I reveal them to you, there will not be mystery. They'll be known. Now, there are many things that we don't know about God, about angels, about Satan, about heaven, about Christ, and so forth. We don't know them because they have not been revealed. But there are a lot of things that we know which have been revealed. So when we go to Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29, the Bible says something that we ought to note. Deuteronomy 29 and Verse 29, uh, uh, the Bible says something that is important. Let's read it. I think you've read it before, but let's read it again. 29.29 says, The secret things belong unto God, unto the Lord our God. The secret things the things that God has not revealed. But those things which are revealed, those things which are revealed, belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So there are things about God, about Christ, about the Holy Spirit, that have not been revealed. They are known only by God. But there are many things that have been revealed and those belong to us. Now, when it comes to salvation, as we shall see, God has revealed everything about salvation because he wants us to access salvation. He wants us to access salvation. So, so when it comes to even about God, there are things that we know about God, there are things we know about Christ, 
There are things we know about the Holy Spirit, things we know about hell, things we know about heaven because they are revealed in the Bible. There are so many things that are revealed in the Bible. And then the Bible wants us to, then to access those and to do something about them. They are revealed so that we might know them. Let me just refer you to two scriptures. Uh, I think two which are important about this matter of revelation. The first one is John chapter 15 and verse 16. And then the second one is John chapter 17, verses 4 and 5. Please note the scriptures. John 15, verses 16, 15, verse 15. And Christ says there, and verse 15, we're going to read it in NIV. He says, I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. So Christ says there that he does not hold as secret the things that the Father revealed to him, and he in turn is revealed to his uh, disciples. So as we disciple people, we are not hoarding information. We are not hiding information. Or we are not hoarding it. Uh, our duty is that what God reveals to us, we pass it on to you. As we do so, God will reveal more to us. But as we hoard the, the information that God reveals to us, then God also stops the channel of revelation because we're selfish. What we know, we don't pass it on to others. Now, when you go to chapter 17, uh, verses 6 and 7, maybe up to 8, yes, 6 to 8, Christ says in John 17, 6, I have revealed you, talk about God, to those whom you gave me out of the world. That's 17.6a. So Christ came to the world to reveal his Father. He wants us to know the Father. And he taught a lot about the Father in the Gospels. He taught a lot about the Father <clears throat> because he wants us to know the Father. He also revealed the Father and through his own life, he came to the earth so that those who were alive when he was on the earth, they could see him. And then he says in uh, John 14, verse 9, anyone who has seen me has seen my father. And now those who saw him wrote what they saw of Christ. So that, the, so that there's a sense in which we also have seen Christ from the pages of the scriptures. And then he goes on in verse 7. He says, Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. Verse 8. For I gave them the words you gave me. So God revealed himself to his son. He gave him words with which to reveal himself. And Christ says, I have given the words which you, my Father, have given to me. Given the words. They knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. So he revealed the Father and he revealed the words of the Bible, particularly the Old Testament. 
so we can see that mystery, according to Christ, is not something to be hidden, but it is something to be revealed. That's important. Now, the word mystery appears 24 times in the NIV Bible and 22 times in the King James Version of the Bible. What is interesting is that the word mystery in the Old Testament is used only in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 4. In Daniel chapter 2, it has to do with the dream which Nebuchadnezzar dreamed and forgot. And then he called his magicians and astrologers and told them that I've dreamed something that disturbed me, but I don't remember it. So I want you to tell me the dream I dreamed, which I have forgotten. Secondly, <clears throat> I want you to give me the interpretation of the dream. And if you fail to give me the interpretation of the dream, I'll kill you. You must tell me my dream, tell me its meaning, and if you fail, I'll kill you. And a man called Ariok, uh, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, said to him, do not ex execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I'll interpret the dream for him. Then when he was taken to the king, Arab took Daniel to the king at once, said, I found a man who can interpret the dream. And Daniel prayed with his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and God revealed the mystery of the dream. So in chapter 2, the mystery re refers to the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had dreamed and forgot. And God had to reveal the dream and the interpretation. Then in chapter 4, another king called Belteshazzar, Belteshazzar dreamed a dream. But with him, he did not forget the dream. He remembered the dream, but he did not know the interpretation. Uh, this is in Daniel 4, verse 9. I said, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream interpreted for me. And then he mentioned the dream, and Daniel interpreted the dream. Those are the only occurrences of the word dream in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, no, the, 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 the meaning of the word mystery, sorry, mystery, uh, in the Old Testament, found only in Daniel. But in the New Testament, it is found in 18 other places. 18 other places in NIV. And then when you go to uh, the book of, uh, I'm sorry, when you go to the King James Version, the King James Version mentions five other meanings of the word mystery, which are not found in, uh, in the King James Version. Uh, Mark chapter 4 verse 1 uh, is mentioned in King James and is not mentioned in Mark. I'm just giving you that background. It says, and Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd gathered around him, was so large, and he got into the boat and said, oh, let me read it in King James, I'm sorry. 
Um, it says, uh, and he began again to teach by the sea, and they gathered unto him uh, a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat uh, in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. It does not uh, speak of the word mystery. Uh, maybe I've misquoted uh, the scripture. I will get it again. It is in Mark. Let me get, I'll get it to you uh, in Mark. Um, the word mystery appears in the King James Version. It appears also in Thessalonians, and it appears also in a Revelation. That was just the background. Now, we want now to look at the mysteries of the gospel. Please allow me just to mention them without elaborating on them. Please allow me to do that so that we can focus on the mist of salvation. But the mist of the gospel are many. Uh, I will mention only seven of them without elaborating on them. Please listen carefully. There is the mystery of incarnation. Incarnation is Christ is God becoming a human being. You can also understand that that should be a mystery. How does God become a human being? And we get this in John 1 verse 14, talking about Christ. In order to appreciate this, we need to go to John chapter 1, verse 1 first. John chapter 1 and verse 1. John 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning, beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it refers to Christ. He says he was God. He was in the beginning with God, and he was God. Uh, Christ is God. Then this Christ who is God, verse 14 says, in verse 14, this Christ who is God, the Bible tells us it became a human being. So verse 14, so the word became human and he lived here on earth among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the, the only son of the father. So it was a mystery that Christ, who is God, had to become a human being. And that had to do with salvation. Because God is spirit, John 4.24 God is spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, a spirit cannot be nailed to the cross. Now, Christ had to become a human being so that he could die on the cross to represent a human beings. He had to become one of the members of the human race, one of the members of the human race in order to die vicariously. It means to die in the place of, in order to die vicariously for us. He had to become a human being. And then he died on the cross as a human being, dying on behalf of human beings. So incarnation is a mystery. That's the first mystery of the gospel. 
The second mystery of the gospel is the virgin birth. This Christ had to be born by a virgin, not by someone who had had a sexual relationship with a man and became pregnant. There was a reason for that. And this mystery was first prophesied by Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaiah 7, verse 14. It says uh, in Isaiah 7, verse 14, uh, in NIV, it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a, a son. He will conceive and bear a son and shall call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God is with us. Uh, so this was a prophecy of a virgin who has not had sexual relationship with a man conceiving. That's a mystery. How does it happen? But someone who has not met with a man conceives and gives birth to a human being. And then when you go to Matthew uh, chapter 123, we are told that this pro prophecy of Isaiah in Isaiah 7, 7 verse 14 is fulfilled in Christ. So verse 23 says, the virgin will be with a child and will give birth to a son. They shall call him, him Emmanuel, which means God with us. This was referring to Mary uh, becoming pregnant with Christ. Mary herself, when she was told in Luke that she was going to become pregnant, she expressed amazement. She said, how can this thing be? Because I don't know a man. How can this be? I don't know a man. Um, and then the Bible explains how this would take place. Uh, it says in uh, verse 28, the angel went to her and said, Greetings to you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. You will, you will be with a child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great, and he will, call, he will be called the Son of the Most High. The God will be with the Lord God will be with him. I'm sorry, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and therefore she will reign and so forth. Then Mary asked in verse thirty-four. He says, since I am a virgin, how will this be? How will this be? This is uh, Luke 134. How will this be since I'm a virgin? And then uh, verses 35 to 48 explain how that will take place. So the virgin birth is a mystery. Christ had to be, had to be born by a virgin because if he had been born <clears throat> by a union between a man and a woman, he would have inherited a sinful nature. Like all humans born of that union are born with a sinful nature. <clears throat> that would have disqualified him from dying on the cross for our sins. Because a sinner cannot die for other sins. So he had to be born sinless. Is the sinless? Lamb of God, 
because he was born only of a woman. So the virgin birth is a, a mystery. Then other mysteries are not explained because the, as we continue with our studies, we'll deal with them. The mystery of the removal of the sinful nature. It's a mystery. We'll explain it. The mystery of substitutionary death of Christ. Christ dying for us. That's a mystery. We'll explain that. The mystery of co-death of us dying with Christ. When he died, we died with him. That's a mystery. We'll explain uh, that as we continue. Then the mystery of uh, Christ being our life. We call it substitutionary life. Christ becoming our life. It's a mystery which we will explain. And then the last mystery we'll explain as we continue is the mystery of the deprogramming and the reprogramming of the mind. You remember in uh, Romans chapter 2, chapter 12, verse 2, speaks of the renewal of the mind. There's a mystery when you become a Christian, when your mind is renewed. Uh, Romans 12, verse 2, do not, do not conform, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Those are the mysteries that we'll look at in uh, as we continue with the study. So number one, we have defined the word mystery. Number two, we have explained very briefly many other mysteries that are associated with Christ and salvation. The mystery of incarnation, the mystery of the virgin birth, the mystery of the removal of the sinful nature, the mystery of co-death with Christ, the mystery of substitutionary death of Christ, Christ dying in our place, the mystery of sub substitutionary life of Christ, Christ becoming our life, and the mystery of deprogramming and reprogramming of our minds. Now we want then to get into the mystery as it relates to salvation. And I want to mention eight things very quickly, but our focus will be on Ephesians chapter 3, verses 2 to 9. That's where we will spend our time. And we will also read Colossians uh, chapter, no, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. Yes, I've said 2 to, uh, two to 9, I'm sorry. Then Colossians 1, 26, 27. Colossians 4, verse 3. First Timothy 3 and verse 16. Let me repeat the scriptures we'll be looking at. Write them down. We'll first look at Romans 11.25. We won't spend time explaining that, but look at it. Then we'll spend a lot of time in Ephesians uh, chapter 3, verses 3 to 9. That's what we'll do. Uh, Ephesians 3, 3 to 9. Then we'll look at Colossians 1, 26-27. Colossians 1, 26-27. And Colossians 4, verse 3. And then the last one will be 1 Timothy 3, 16. We'll look at those scriptures very briefly. But we'll not be brief when we go to Ephesians chapter 3. Let's look at Romans chapter uh, 11 and verse 25. 11, 25, 
is talking about the salvation of the Jews. I really don't have much time to explain it, but let me read it. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the number of the Gentiles has come in. And so all of Israel will be saved. Verse 30, all of Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. Uh, here it is said that the Jews don't accept Christ. They reject Christ as their Messiah. And most of them hardened against Christ. But there are a few Jews who are called Messianic Jews. They are called Messian Mess Messianic Jews because those Jews have accepted the gospel and say they are saved. Now the Bible explains a mystery. It says that God caused the hearts of the Jews to be hard so as to give an opportunity to Gentiles to receive the gospel. Then it says there's this dispensation of the salvation of the Gentiles, this period of the salvation of the Gentiles. It says this salvation of the Gentiles will continue until the second coming of Christ, when the church shall be raptured to heaven. It says until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. There's a certain number of the Gentiles who will be saved, who will be saved. And once the full number of the Gentiles has come into salvation, then God will turn to the Jews. This will be during the tribulation period. They will believe the gospel. They will accept Christ. They will be severely persecuted by the Antichrist for accepting Christ. I hope you have understood that. That's the mystery of the salvation of the Jews during the tribulation period after the church shall have been taken and raptured to heaven. It's found in Romans chapter 11 from verse 25 all the way to verse 32, the salvation of the Jews. Then the second mystery is found in Ephesians. That mystery refers to us. In Ephesians uh, chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 to 9, it says, let's begin in verse 2 to get the whole context. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace <clears throat> that was given to me for you speaking to the Gentiles. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation. All mysteries are made <clears throat> known by revelation. I have already written briefly about it. So in verse 3, uh, Paul says, he understands the mystery of salvation, salvation because it has been revealed to him. There is no one in the Bible who have the deepest revelation of salvation more than Paul. There's no one. Paul has deep revelation of salvation. And he says it was given to him. Then verse 4 he says, in reading this then, you'll be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. 
So verse 4 speaks of the mystery of Christ, the mystery of his birth, the mystery of his life on earth, and more importantly, the mystery of his death on the cross and the mystery of resurrection and ascension. He says God has given him a special insight into the mystery of Christ. That's Ephesians 4, 3 verse 4. Then verse 5, he says, which was not made known to man in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to God's holy apostles and prophets. This verse is very important for you to note that this mystery, the prophets wrote about it, and the Bible says they we really desired to know what they were prophesying about, but they couldn't understand. They were just prophesying. It was revealed, uh, verse 5, is, is the mystery. This mystery was not known in other generations. It is revealed to the apostles and prophets. The prophets of the Old Testament and the prophets of the New Testament, like Agabus, and to the apostles primarily, because the mystery of salvation is really clearer in the New Testament than it is in the Old Testament, and it is revealed to all the apostles, particularly Apostle Paul. That's verse 5. Now, verse 6 says, This mystery that is through the gospel or oh, this mystery is known by the gospel the gospel is the explanation of salvation through the death and resurrection of christ that explanation of the gospel of the i mean explanation of salvation through the death and re resurrection of christ is known as the gospel when you go to 1 Corinthians 15, it explains that the gospel is based on the death and resurrection of Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance. Something that is very important is something of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. First Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. So the gospel is based on the death and resurrection of Christ. Now Paul then says in verse 6, this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and share us together in the promise of Christ. So the mystery is that God is not just the God of the Jews, but is God of the Jews and the Gentiles. And it is Christ who brought the Gentiles into the household of Israel. It is Christ. It is Christ. Uh, so the mystery here has to do not only with salvation, but particularly with the salvation of Gentiles, salvation of non-Jews in verse 6, salvation of you and I who are not Jews. Uh, your salvation through Christ is a mystery. Verse 7 says, I became a servant of this gospel and by the gift of by the gift of God's grace given me through the work of his power. So whenever you have the privilege of understanding the gospel, first of all, accepting the gospel and it 
allowing it to work in your own life. And then you begin to preach it to others. It's grace. God has extended grace to you to allow you to preach the gospel. Now verse 8. Although I am less than the least of God's uh, people or the apostle, his grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, how this mystery works. To make it plain to everyone how this mystery works, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. So in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 2 to 9, Paul says God gave him the privilege of understanding the mystery of the gospel, to understand it generally. And then God gave him the grace to understand that the gospel also includes people who are not Israelites. People are not Jews. They are also included in Christ. Christ died for the world uh, so that people in the world could be saved. God revealed this to Paul. Now in Colossians uh, chapter 1, Paul says something that is very critical, verses 26 and 27. Colossians 1, 26, 27, he says, he begins by saying in verse 26, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints it is disclosed to those who are born again, to the saints. You can only understand this mystery when you become saved. It is revealed to the saints, to them. God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles this glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you. Oh, the mystery is Christ. And the mystery is Christ who can end a person's life, who can end your life and become your savior. Christ who can come inside of you and live in you. That's a mystery. How can God come into a human being and live inside of a human being by his spirit? How can that happen? It's a mystery. But this mystery is revealed in the gospel. Once God opens your eyes to understand that Christ is knocking at the door of your heart, and if you open the door and come in, you can't fully understand this because it is a mystery. You can't understand it because it is a mystery the mystery of the gospel, but Christ can come inside of you. And then when, when you open your heart without fully understanding to an extent that you can explain it, can't explain it, you just open your heart, Christ will come in. The mystery of Christ, the mystery of the indwelling Christ, the mystery of Christ who comes in and dwells in those who have received him as Lord and Savior. Colossians 2 verse 6 speaks about the reception. Colossians 2 verse 6. So then, just as you have received Jesus Christ as Lord, you have received Jesus Christ. Why have you received him? into your life. He becomes the Lord of your life. Continue to live in him. 
So it is the mystery of Christ who lives in us and us living in Christ. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. That's a mystery. The mystery that we, being human beings, can live in Christ who is God. And the mystery of Christ who is God can live in us. This is double indwelling. Sometimes when we speak of indwelling, we think of single indwelling, Christ indwelling us. But we are also indwelling Christ. At John uh, 14, verse 20, it says, let's read it, John 14 and verse 20. Uh, we dwell in Christ. Uh, it says in 14 verse 20, On that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me. You are in me. And I am in you. Double in dwelling. You are in me, and I am in you. That's a mystery. The mystery of the double indwelling of Christ. And then uh, Colossians 4, verse 3, says this mystery must be proclaimed. 4, verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Verse 3, Colossians 4, 3, and pray for me too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ. So we are praying that we, the doors will open to us to proclaim the mystery of Christ. This mystery must be preached because people cannot be saved without this mystery. It has to be preached. And we need to pray that God will open doors for us to preach Christ and him crucified and the results of his crucifixion, the forgiveness of sins, redemption, atonement, reconciliation with the Father, uh, propitiation. All these words are found in the Bible. The Bible says uh, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. So the mystery of salvation has to be proclaimed so that other people also may embrace it. And then the last verse I want to refer to concerning mystery is 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16. 3 16. It says, beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. It's talking about the mystery of how a human being was born in sin, who has committed sin, can become godly. The mystery of godliness. It is based on the fact that Christ became incarnate. He appeared in the body, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, then was taken up to heaven. So this mystery starts from incarnation, uh, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the ascension of Christ. When we accept what the Bible teaches about the death of Christ, that lays a basis for people living a godly life. It's called the, his, the mystery of godliness. Now, the last point I want to mention to you, and I'm praying that uh, uh, it will have an impact on you. Point four. Point four is that this mystery is not understood. This mystery of salvation is known experientially and not intellectually. Let me repeat that. This is the last point. The mystery of salvation is known experientially and not 
intellectually. Uh, you you can't you can't taste salvation intellectually by reading and understanding it in the, understanding it even when your understanding is accurate yes we begin there but your full understanding of the gospel does not save you until you receive Christ into your life as your lord and savior so the Bible speaks of Christ in you. You only experience the mystery of salvation when you allow Christ to come in, into your life. It is Christ in you. It is Christ in you. That's the mystery. It's when you experience Christ into your life when you receive Christ into your life. Uh, when you go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 3, it uses the word taste. 2, verse 3. Now that you've tasted that the Lord is good, does, it doesn't say now that you've understood. They say the taste of the pudding is in the eating. It is not in the intellectual understanding of the ingredients of a pudding and how pudding is prepared. It is in the eating. So Christ, the mystery of salvation, you can only understand it in its reality when you receive Christ. And then you realize that Christ is God. There is no other way of uh, experiencing the mystery of salvation except by receiving Christ into your life as Lord and Savior. Have you ever received Christ? Is Christ dwelling in you? Are you living a godly life because a, the godly one lives in you? Uh, have you tasted how good the Lord is? It happens only when you receive Christ into your life as Lord and Savior. Then the Bible in Hebrews 6 says, once you do that, you begin to experience heavenly things and you taste the things of the word of God. Hebrews uh, chapter 6 verse 5. Once you receive Christ, you, you experience heaven on earth. That's not exaggeration. It really, you really experience heaven on earth. It says in verse 4, it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, we have shared in the Holy Spirit. Salvation is the, is the gift from heaven. When you receive Christ, you are tasting the heavenly gift. You are even tasting the things of heaven. And then you share in the Holy Spirit. And verse 5, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God. When you receive Christ, you taste the goodness of the word of God. And the power of the coming age. You experience the power of the coming age. You even exercise the power of the coming age when you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Then the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 2, examine yourself whether, whether you have experienced the mist of salvation. Examine yourself. It says, examine yourself. Are you really Christian? Have you really uh, experienced 
the minister of salvation, what is the test? Uh, 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. When you read that, I think in the message Bible says, examine yourself to see whether you're Christians or not. Uh, is it a message of the Amplified? There's a scripture that says, a version that says, examine yourself whether you are Christians or not. Um, uh, it says, yes, there's a scripture that says so, a version that says so. Examine yourself whether you are in the faith. To be in the faith is to be a Christian. Test yourselves. Examine yourselves. Test yourselves. Examine yourself. Test yourself. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Are the as a test, the litmus test is whether Christ is in you or Christ is not in you. If Christ is not in you, you are not in the faith, you're not a Christian. But if Christ is in you, you are a Christian. If Christ is in you, then you are a Christian. But if Christ is not in you, you are not a Christian. This is found in Philippians, in that text, 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, in the Philips New Testament. You should be looking at yourselves to make sure that you are really Christ's. That's Philip's New Translation. And now Philip's New Testament. You should be looking at yourselves to make sure that you are Christ. You are really Christ. It is yourselves that you should be testing, not me. You ought to know by this time that Christ is in you unless you are not really Christians. So if Christ is not in, in you, you are not really Christians. So you apply the test and see if Christ is in you. That's the test. And if Christ is in you, then you know experientially the mystery of salvation. I pray that God will be teaching you a lot as you go through this teaching. You may not uh, finish it in one sitting. It may be two installments. You take half of it and you discuss it, and you take the last part of it and you discuss it. I pray that you will watch this. You'll be taking notes. The one leading the Bible study will know when to stop. And then you look at the scriptures as they are being cited. And then you discuss them. This is the mystery of salvation. The Lord bless you. Father, we thank you for this teaching. We pray that it will become clear to your people. You will bless them. It will explain deep truths which they had not known. And now it has pleased you to reveal those truths to through, through this teaching, through your word. We thank you and we bless you. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. Thank you. Trusting that this teaching will be good to you. The Lord will help you and reveal a lot of things to you. Thank you.